Hi everyone, Sean here, and welcome to this video called Understanding the Final Solution. The purpose of this presentation is just to share my thoughts on events surrounding World War II, but from a biblical perspective, and in order to expose what I believe is the true driving forces behind the scenes that compelled the Nazi regime. So what prompted this video? A few years ago, I had the privilege of going on a trip to Israel, and on that trip, I visited the Holocaust Museum with my family. While walking through the exhibits, I came to a section regarding the final solution, and on one of the walls there was a quote from one of the surviving prisoners of Auschwitz. It read, The camp's law is that those going to their death should be deceived until the end. And I was struck by the statement because the thought came to me, this sounds just like how Satan is dealing with humanity. Firstly, people in their own personal individual lives, being deceived up until the very end, are dying in their sins, not knowing the world they tread through. And secondly, I also get this feeling that this is the same plan for humanity as we approach the final days. We know from the scriptures that Satan will be given an hour before the return of Jesus and before this is all said and done. And I believe that the same spirit that was behind the evil, insidious plan of the Jewish Holocaust and the final solution is also very much the author of the events that will unfold in the final days and the coming tribulation that the Bible speaks of. So this is important to keep in mind. The enemy we are dealing with has been and will continue using willing participants to achieve their objectives and will remain hidden until the very last moment. As I was doing research on some of the topics, more and more interesting information came out and the presentation just kept growing and growing and perhaps I did put too much into it. However, I think it is all important and I'll try and keep things as concise as possible. So let's get going. And to start, I'm going to read from this abstract, which will just add a bit of credence to my next slides and the thoughts about the events that unfolded in this time in history. So since the 1940s, scholars have debated the question, did Hitler and his henchmen plan the final solution decades before 1941? And many have answered in the affirmative. However, examination of the, those developments that led to the final solution raises serious questions. Although some have declared that the Nazis with Hitler at the helm did indeed plan the mass execution even before the 1930s, nowhere is there any pronouncement of this before 1939. So perhaps to put that in simpler terms, there were plans being laid out with very long-term intentions as well as being implemented well before the killing started. This is in essence what I hope to illuminate, the long-term planning and the true driving forces behind those plans, if you can see it. Before we continue, please keep in mind, my view of this world and the events that have unfolded in recent as well as in the distant past are the events of the Bible. Many know the scriptures about how we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against spiritual wickedness in high places, but we quickly forget them and go back to looking at things as though they are simply the devices of flawed and misguided individuals and people that just are evil. I just wanted to make it clear that my view and the remainder of this presentation is about the battle between the Most High God and His Kingdom versus the fallen cherub Satan and His fallen one-third of the heavenly host. The battle is for men's souls, and it is very real, and it has been raging for thousands of years, and will continue until the very end, till it comes to its final conclusion. Because as it was in the past, so it shall be again, and there is nothing new under the sun. The understanding of types and shadows will help a lot in this presentation. If you don't know what I mean by that, uh, simply put, the Bible has stories and characters that repeat themselves um, and there are cycles in the Bible. And this is important to help interpret the Bible um, and interpret the meaning of different stories. But I also believe it is a way of warning and helping God's true disciples to understand the correlation of events and also the times that we are in even today. 
So where did it start? I wanted to do a little research to see how did the war start. I was curious what dragged the world into this protracted, brutal war. And I nearly fell off my chair when I read about the Klevitz incident. Not because of surprise that it was a false flag, but because of the way the information is out there and it's being presented as a false flag. If people were to take note how many times wars in history have been initiated through false flags, you'd be pretty surprised. And it would become apparent that there is a repeated process, the Hegelian dialectic, problem, reaction, solution. False flags and those who make use of the Hegelian dialectic isn't the purpose of my presentation, but I would encourage everyone to go out and do more research on the subject, and you'll see how manipulated this world has been through manufactured events. So if you don't know what a false flag is, this is a prime example of one. The Klewitz incident was a false flag on the German radio station Slender Klewitz, staged by Nazi Germany on the night of the 31st of August 1939, along with some two dozen similar incidents. The attack was manufactured by Germany and it was to justify the invasion of Poland, which began the very next morning. The attackers posed as Polish nationals. So this is typically how a false flag is initiated where there are individuals which are planning and will execute a event that they manufacture and control themselves. All right. So that's important to understand. And that's how the war really got going. It was the proverbial spark that ignited the flame. So there are two other topics I've highlighted in the slide. One being Operation Himmler, or specifically Heimlich Himmler that I want to discuss, and the other is propaganda. But we're going to go to propaganda first, because this is a word that you will come across quite a lot when researching World War II. If you say propaganda regarding Nazi Germany, then the next thought that should come to your mind should be Joseph Goebbels. Let's consider these statements. Goebbels was particularly interested in controlling the radio, which was still then a fairly new mass medium. How strange to think that not so long ago the radio was considered a new medium. And then the other statement is, Albert Speer, Hitler's architect and later Minister of Armaments and War Production, later said that the regime made the complete use of all technical and I would argue spiritual means for domination of its own country. Through technical devices like the radio and loudspeaker, 80 million people were deprived of independent thought. Let's consider the end of the statement for a moment. 80 million people were deprived of independent thought. And here's an image of radios being handed out freely during Goebbels' birthday. Oh, isn't that nice? Here's your free mind control device. People are gladly taking them. So what's the significance? Remember, think of the higher entities pulling the strings, bringing all these tools and technologies into full bear against the German population. If they were able, as Albert Speer said, to de deprive the entire German population of independent thought, can you imagine what could be achieved with today's technologies? So where are the shadows and where are the types? What are the tools and technologies that have been used against our generation that have taken away our independent thought? It's not coming, it's already here. I think to say we are living in a world driven by dopamine fixes and short-term gratification is easy to see. Most people can see and understand that there is something unhealthy about these habits associated with you know, social media, mobile device dependence. But going back to my earlier statements, how would humanity feel if they were aware that entities of a much more nefarious intention was behind the drive and the adoption of these technologies? Would people so easily give up their independent thought? Of course not. Do you think the German public knew they were being programmed and brainwashed? No. Do you think people know that the same thing is happening to them today? Nope. To those that are awake, remember the game plan. Remember, there is a final solution, and it is still in play. And while we're on the subject of brainwashing propaganda, I can't leave without mentioning the mainstream news media. And if you think I'm exaggerating, take a look at this. 
Hi, I'm Fox San Antonio's Jessica Headley. And I'm Ryan Wolf. Our, our greatest, greatest responsibility, responsibility is, is to, to serve, serve our, our Treasure Valley communities. The El Paso Las Cruces communities. Eastern Iowa communities. Mid-Michigan communities. We are extremely proud of the quality, balanced journalism that CBS4 News produces. But we, we are concerned, concerned about trouble and trying to be responsible, one-sided news stories, stories plaguing our country. country. Plaguing our country. The sharing of biased and false news has become all too common on social media. More alarming, some media outlets publish the same fake stories without checking facts first. The sharing of biased and false, false news, news has, has become, become all too common, common on, on social, social media. media. More alarming, some media Unfortunately, some members of the media use their platforms to push their own personal bias and agenda to control exactly what people think. And this is extremely dangerous to our democracy. 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 To end this topic of propaganda, the other word that you will find closely associated with propaganda and that follows on its heels is censorship. On the 2nd of September 1939, the day after the start of the war, Goebbels and the Council of Ministers proclaimed it illegal to listen to foreign radio stations. Now, I'm not sure how many of you know of Alex Jones and of Infowars, and I don't agree with everything he has, has to say and what he stands for, but even so, that's not the point. The reason I'm bringing up is what everyone should know, is that in 2018, his independent channels and platforms were all taken down overnight from multiple sources, and this should terrify people. What this event told me was that a group of interconnected, let's call them individuals, made a decision to flip a switch and terminate his accounts on all of these platforms overnight. A voice informing his audience on topics and insights contrary to what they wanted people to hear. He was reaching too many people with a different message and they shut it down. Just look at the list of companies and just think what on earth could be behind so many large corporations to coordinate and act in union to shut down a platform. The time is approaching when all technological mediums and technologies will once again play an important part in the downfall of humanity and their independent thought. And unfortunately, the next time it won't just be a country, but the world, because everyone was willing to accept the free radios. Well, let's move on. Heinrich Himmler. He was the commander of the Schutzstaffel, or the SS. He was one of the most powerful men in Nazi Germany and the main architect of the Holocaust. Well, at least that's what the history books say about him. And while this is true, there is more to Himmler that should be investigated. I'll start by using this article that was published on the Daily Mail. As the title of the article states, there was a trove of 13,000 occult books found in the Czech library that belonged to Himmler. I'm just going to go and put out a few points that I found quite interesting in this article that I'd like to bring to everyone's attention. I'm just going to read parts of these. So, firstly, it was a 13,000-strong collection that was found in a depot um, of the National Library of the Czech Republic. But it was um, discovered or it was highlighted by a Norwegian Masonic researcher that some of the books came from the library of the Norwegian Order of Freemasons in Oslo, seized during Nazi occupation. And if you have any doubts about the nature and the true objectives of Freemasonry, this should, if anything, cause you to sit up and question why. Why would a lodge have a stash of books on the occult and witchcraft? 
Now, I'm not going to go into Freemasonry in this video. I've already covered that in previous videos. And if you're interested, I'll put a link and you can go and look more about the intentions and what the Freemasons represent. Um, but I'm going to carry on reading on over here. In 1935, Himmler founded the Ha Sonne Commando. I'm sorry, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, but that's the way I would think it is. Um, it's standing for Hex, the German word for witch, to collate as much material as possible on sorcery, the occult, and the supernatural. Now, this should be an indication just how serious Himmler took the pursuit of knowledge of the occult. And this is what the next part of the article and what the points that I want to highlight really frustrate me. It was written, Himmler was obsessed with the occult and mysticism, believing the Hocus Pocus books held the key to the Aryan supremacy in the world. As well as one of Himmler's quack theories was that the Roman Catholic Church tried to destroy the German race through witch hunts. If you hadn't noticed, the writer of this article is applying an obvious form of psychological manipulation or influence over the reader, but trivializing and diminishing the seriousness of the information that was just presented by using the words hocus pocus and quack theories. Even the word obsessed, let's change that to deeply devoted. Heinrich Himmler was deeply devoted in his quest for occult knowledge. And let me tell you, if just a fraction of the Christians were as deeply devoted in searching the word and seeking answers from the Holy Spirit as Himmler was in his pursuit for lost knowledge of the occult and everything to do with the occult, this world would be a different place. This man and his so-called quack theories, directed, I believe, by spiritual wickedness, tore a gaping wound in our world that decimated millions of lives. Here you can see one of the authentic letters sent to Heinrich Himmler with information about a witch that fell into his lineage. I actually uh, went to Google Translate and I did a translation just to see what was written in it and if it was in fact talking about um, a witch. And it does, it, you know, relate this story. But what most normal people don't realize is that this um, information he was seeking and what he was interested in might not seem important to us, but to people that are in their cult and studying their cult, it is important to them. Um, and let's just leave it at that. Let's take a look at the SS for a moment. The Schutzstaffel, more commonly known as the SS, was a division of men primarily for party security. Under Heinrich Himmler, they grew from what I believe was about 300 men to a paramilitary force of over a million. Why I bring them up is to draw correlations between their immediate commander, Heinrich Himmler, and the use of symbolism throughout their existence. I'm going to start with the most notorious of the symbols attached to the SS, and that's the double lightning strike that the officers had on their collars. This lightning strike insignia was developed and adapted from a set of Armenian runes, which we're going to get into in a moment. But what I want to draw everyone's attention to is the fact that they refer to them as runes. Again, most people do not study and understand uh, the occult or and ancient cultures. And the use of runes was a very common practice with the Nordic and Germanic tribes when it came to practicing magic. So this brings me to Gandalf. I mean, Guido. Guido van Lust was a Austrian occultist, and if you research his background story, as a child he was brought up Catholic, and in a incident where he, I believe, went into a pagan type of temple, he effectively gave over his life to Wotan. This is one of the ancient Germanic gods, and he devoted himself to Wotanism. Now, again, most people won't recognize that and don't understand what that actually means. And I thought it would be interesting just to go a little bit deeper and, and uncover what ultimately was the driving force behind this Wotanism and what were the influences of this on the German Nazi regime. So here is something that I thought uh, should be pointed out regarding Guido. What he believed... And what is the truth of this is less of a concern. What I'm trying to highlight is the perspective that he looked at things from. And for example, the Maltese cross. 
The way that Guido interpreted it and what he saw in its symbolism is completely different from what a run-of-the-mill Christian might see. And that's really important to understand because that's key to how the enemy has been staying hidden for so long and unexposed. And you might say, well, that's a strange statement, staying hidden. What do I mean by that? What I'm trying to show everyone here and what I hope people will see is that I believe that the Nazi regime served the old gods, knowingly or unknowingly. Here's an image of Wotan and his son Tyre. And again, most people wouldn't have recognized the name Wotan, but just about everyone knows him because it's Odin. Now, everyone knows Odin because of the Marvel movies. And you might look at Tyre and you think, well, that doesn't look like Thor. Now, does it look like Thor? And this goes all the way back to what I've covered before in, I think it was the Freemasonry videos. So the old gods were appropriated from previous cultures, from Greeks to Romans, all the way down to the Nordics and Germanic tribes. Quite simply, it's different names for the same gods. And if I have to be even more obvious, it's different names for the same fallen angels and Satan. And one of the things that I didn't pick up and I didn't quite understand until doing research in this is the symbolism throughout the ages of Satan setting up a type similar to what God is. Remember, he tries to emulate the God of the Bible. He tries to be like God. And therefore, in his way of doing things, he is also preparing to bring and usher in his version of Jesus, the Antichrist. And I didn't see it until now, the correlation between the All-Father, which I believe is Satan, and Tyre or Thor or Mars or Ares as the coming Antichrist. If you recognize what Jesus was saying in the Bible, when he mentioned the leading up to the tribulation as a period of birth pains, I really believe that um, it was a... Um, also indication of the coming of a birth of the Antichrist. And that's, again, something that the mystery schools have been building towards since forever. Now I'm aware of the sort of uh, pantheon of gods with the extra sons of these different gods, Zeus and Jupiter. You know, they had Apollo and Sol Invictus and Helios. Um, Again, I think throughout the ages, this story has been evolved and changed to try and adapt to ultimately, you know, Satan has to continue his deception as and when God was releasing the word and things were being revealed to humanity. So it, it got a little messy um, from the, you know, um, ancient pantheon of God's side of things. But in the, the day, like I said, um, the now to tell everyone, uh, if you understand that we are living in the world of the Bible, and I'll actually go through and show you some of the scriptures where God told us plainly that what we are dealing with are the fallen heavenly host. Satan, yes, but you know there are other entities involved as well. I thought this was just interesting. Um, again, because we're talking about these old gods and symbolism, um, the sign that the masons use which is often referred to as the hidden hand uh, they give one reason or a series of reasons as what it means but I ultimately believe that it's actually really just a uh, acknowledgement or a sign towards the coming antichrist um, i might be wrong but that's what i see when i look at it but you'll notice i've put that scripture from 2 timothy but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Because ultimately, I think many of them know that they're deceiving others, but I don't think they realize they themselves are also being deceived. I just wanted to touch on some of the attributes and the symbolism associated with Jupiter and Zeus. In a lot of the ancient artwork and reliefs, Zeus or Jupiter would be seen grasping lightning bolts, as well as riding on a giant eagle. Also quite often you would see Zeus holding this staff with an eagle on top of it. 
These are important because, again, symbolism is something that, though we might not take much notice of, to other groups of people, symbolism is extremely important. One of the other depictions of Jupiter quite often was also seen as simply an eagle holding bolts of lightning. That would also have been an indication of the god being present. This is just an observation. I noticed that there is a specific politician that is an American politician that quite frequently has this brooch. And it is one of these staffs with an eagle on top of it. The Bible teaches us you'll know them by their fruits. I honestly believe that the American people can count their blessings that Hillary Clinton didn't win in the last elections because I have a feeling that Nancy Pelosi could very well have been her Heinrich Himmler. That's of course just my opinion. Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. Who do you think the eagle is that God is referring to over here? Let's just take a step back and look at some of the scriptures and then try and see the correlations to these old gods I've just highlighted. Keeping in mind we are still living in the story of the Bible and these entities are still as active as they were in the Old Testament. In fact, I'd say they're more active today because they know their time is short. So in 2 Kings 17 verse 16, And they left all the commandments of the Lord their God and made them molten images even two calves and made a grove, and worshipped all the hosts of heaven, and served Baal. In Deuteronomy 17 verse 13, And hath gone and served other gods, and worshipped them, either the sun, or the moon, or any of the host of heaven, which I have not commanded. And then in 2 Kings 23, um, To bring forth out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal, and for the grove, and for all the hosts of heaven. And in 2 Chronicles, He rears up altars for Baalim, and made groves, and worshipped all the hosts of the heaven, and served them. And then in Acts even, Then God turned, and gave them up to worship the hosts of heaven. So, if you hadn't noticed, God's quite often referring to Baal and the hosts of heaven. He separates them. There's a distinction between this primary little g-god and the other hosts of heaven. Of course, he's referring to the fallen angels. So this is what I'm trying to show and what I'm hoping people start to see is that these entities are still active and have been active and God has been warning us about them since the beginning. Something else you might find interesting is that Baal was the storm god of the Canaanites and the temple of Jupiter actually is built in Baalbek. So it shouldn't take much for you to understand that it's again an appropriated god that's just been passed down from generation to generation. Here is a rune clock which is effectively like a circular table that was developed to associate the different runes with different gods and the zodiac. But I just wanted to point out it's actually quite interesting if you look at the way that it's configured, it's 18 symbols and if you look carefully it's broken up into 666. Six, six. Anyway, that's just stupid hocus pocus, right? Never mind. So I'm not going to go through all the runes, but I thought that it's important to point some of them out especially these two over here, the Lieben and Todd. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but basically it's the life and the death rune. Now, why I thought this was interesting is if you read in this description, um, I'm not going to go through all of it. It's just there was a part where it mentions that during World War II, the two runes, the, I'm just going to say life and death runes, came to be used in obituaries and on tombstones as marking birth and death dates. So again, you've got to put yourself in people's shoes and understand that this is the same as you putting a cross, a Christian cross on yours. It shows who you devoted to, who you serve. And this is why I keep saying, whether they knew it or not, they served other gods. And this is a big deal and why I'm trying to put this presentation together and help people understand what was the driving force behind Nazi Germany. Here are some images of grave markers that were placed for the dead soldiers. 
And again, if you hadn't known about the Thai rune, you would have looked at it and just seen, you would have assumed that it was just a, you know, a poor representation of a cross. But it actually is a pointing up arrow recognizing Tyre. And on the left one, you can see the, um, the life and the death rune for the life and the death representation of this soldier. So here we've got the Odal and the Tyre rune. And I wanted to highlight this Odal rune because it wasn't just used um, with these different divisions. You're going to see another place that it was utilized um, in a moment. But then there's also the Tyre rune. Now, the Tyre was, rune was appropriated from a older Tiawaz rune. And here you can see an example of one of the soldiers. It was quite often a, um, a symbol that they would have on their... Um, left shoulders but again i want you to understand the symbolism behind it and who that represents when i was doing a bit of research i found it quite interesting i came across this where it was talking about this uh tiwaz rune which when stacked on top of itself it created this effect of a tree and and people that study uh, Germanic paganism basically concluded that what it represented was the invocation of Tyre. Now go back to what I was saying in earlier statements about Tyre representing the Antichrist. And I hadn't even known this, but it pretty much makes sense because that looks to me like that. And if I have to make it any more clearer. So this again is not the purpose of this presentation. I just thought it was interesting and I just kind of stumbled across it. And of course, I couldn't leave this discussion on runes without mentioning the swastika. Now, I got this description from a book called The Viking Spirit, where it says that the swastika or the sun wheel, or at times Thor's hammer, is what it was representing. It had different meanings for different peoples. And I think most people understand if you do research, you'll find that it actually has origins which date back hundreds of years. Even with some rudimentary research, you'll find that the swastika has had its origins in many cultures all across the world. Here's a photo that I took when I was in Beishan. And it was, this is the same Beishan where Saul and his son Jonathan were pinned to the wall. And at some point in history, the Romans came and when conquering Israel, they built a city on top of this called Scythopolis. And again, if you look at the decor and the way that this um, was used as decoration, it was an ancient and has been an ancient symbol for many, many centuries. So when I look at the symbolism, for me, the swastika has obviously had a very definitive um, meaning and it's always been simply associated with Nazi Germany because in my generation that's all I've ever known of it but I try and imagine what people must have thought when they saw this being utilized back then because it wasn't something that had the same connotations as what we have today but again what it should have done and it should have um, the thoughts that should have prevailed in people's minds were that this is pagan at the end of the day, and that's what I'm trying to say, all right, with this part of my presentation, you're just going to have to either believe it or not. It's really up to you. But I wanted to tell a bit of a testimony. I have a friend who is a very active disciple of Jesus, and he told me a testimony once where he walked into a meeting, and as he walked in, he saw that there was a person on the front by the altar who was on the ground, busy manifesting with a demon. And he walked up and he asked if he could help. And in the process, as they were busy casting this thing out of this person, uh, the guy's throat got um, closed. So it was choking him and he couldn't speak. And my friend asked him, you know, what was the Lord showing him? What was causing this? And the person motioned to get a pen and paper. And when he got the pen and paper, he actually wrote on it Freemasonry. And then after that had happened, they then cast the spirit of Freemasonry out of the person and he just, you know, turned to the side and vomited this thing out. And okay, uh, to cut the story short, later on they found out that he was given a Freemasonry ring from his father. 
He never himself participated in Freemasonry, but just the act of utilizing his father's ring, somehow, probably because he might have had other open doors, this thing had gained access and ultimately needed to be cast out of this person. So consider that while I discuss this Aaron ring or honor ring. These were rings that Heinrich Himmler presented to what was originally the old guard, but eventually it got distributed to more and more of the SS officers. And I just, again, to maybe cut the, the story short, I thought, thought it was quite interesting that at some point he ordered that they all be returned to him. So he had about, uh, it says 11,500 returned, and he had them blast sealed inside a hill near by the Bevelsberg Castle. That's a very uh, notorious um, castle that the Nazis made use of. And if they had won the war, that was where they were going to rule the world from, quite simply. And when it says blast sealed, I assume it means that there was a bunker or something that they literally blasted closed behind them. And I can only imagine that the reasoning for that is that these rings would be dug up at some point in the future to reappear. And could there be one ring to rule them all? No, I don't think so. But I do think that there are um, forces behind them, and I do think that it probably does have and exert certain control over the individuals that wore these rings. But that's really just an assumption from my side. See, when I look at World War II and the Holocaust, I see two groups of deceived people. Obviously, there are many more, but in particular, there's the Jewish people and how they were deceived into ultimately um, being rounded up and transported to the death camps to ultimately be slaughtered. And then there's also the German people, how a generation of people could have been driven to do such evil. And again, it was all manipulation on both sides. And when I was thinking of putting this presentation together, part of my thoughts were, you know, to try and understand what motivated the Jews to get on the trains and to go through to these death camps. Because looking back and reading the different accounts, it really just seems surreal to think that, that any of this could have happened. And I understand that across the board, it was primarily because of massive amounts of deception one of the topics, which I know is quite a sensitive topic, but I think it was quite pivotal in what happened, was the Judenrate. Judenrate were established by the Germans. So they had had a task force that was coming in on the heels of the invading army when they initially invaded Poland. The Judenrate were established through a plan that Reinhard Heydrich had um, come up with and again whenever I mention these people I don't credit them for these plans but they were the faces that implemented them the councils were elected but they had to be approved by the Germans and because of this many of the um, Jewish people that were obviously aware and awake to what was happening refused to participate but you can imagine the outcome of this was to manipulate and coerce the Jewish people and they would use people that were pliable and easy to bribe and manipulate. And I know that I'm just a person looking in hindsight, you know, back in the past. But the reason why I'm doing this is also to try and help everyone understand, again, if there are types and shadows and what happened in the past... What are going to be the Judenrate of our day and age? From doing research on the Jewish councils, it brought me to this interesting story. It was about the first transport that was destined for Auschwitz. It goes something like this. All the unmarried women, which were 15 years and older, were to report to the school gymnasium. They were told that they were going to be given three months' work in a shoe factory. Unfortunately, it was really just a deception and a lie, and once the girls had arrived, they were strip-searched and taken away. What was interesting about this first transport was that it was a load specifically of just girls, and the order was that there had to be 999 of them. 
Now, if you read in this um, document over here, there's a lady called um, Heather Dune McAdam, and she wrote a book specifically about these ghouls. And it says that she was researching um, specifically about these ghouls and this transport for almost 20 years. So she's extensively looked into this. And she says that it's my sense that it was Heinrich Himmler um, that made the order for these ghouls, but obviously it wasn't ever proven anywhere. And again, in the statement, she says it may have been his occult obsession, <laughs> um, you think? Another interesting account of the story was that there were 99 prisoners, German prisoners, that were transported to become the warders of Auschwitz. And again, this is all very significant, especially when you see this part. When the girls arrived at Auschwitz, their first job and the function that they had was to build the very infrastructure that would convert the camp into a death machine. So let me explain what I see here. The number itself really is just a signature. It, it indicates that this is either a form of ritual or there is a message over here. And if you understand the story of Esther, I have a belief that Satan and the fallen angels created hell. And, and that's the interpretation I get from the allegory inside of the book of Esther. And if you haven't seen that uh, explanation, I would encourage you to go and look at it. It will explain more about why I believe this. But for me, this shows almost like a confirmation. It's almost like a spiteful, vindictive act that was done where Satan had the Jewish people build their ultimate demise, their hell on earth. And they had prison guards come and be the prison caretakers or the Auschwitz guards, which again, you know, the fallen angels considered themselves to be prisoners under God. And um, while I've been putting this presentation together, I actually came across this psalm. It's in Psalms 35, where it talks about let their way be dark and slippery. Let the angel of the Lord persecute them. For without cause they have hid for me their net in a pit, which without cause they have dug for my soul. Let destruction come upon him at unawares, and let his net that he hath hid catch himself into that very destruction. Let him fall. And here's a few other um, references that I found. Again, it talks about he that made the pit that he falls in it himself. Um, so in Psalms 7 verse 15, he made a pit and digged it and is fallen into the ditch which he made. And the heathen are sunk down in the pit that they made. They prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They have digged a pit before me. Into the midst thereof they are fallen themselves. Whether my view is true or not, it doesn't change the gospel message and it doesn't change the fact that there is a hell and God has freely offered us an eternal life with him. All we need to do from our sides is repent of our sins and be born again. And to finish off, let's revisit our friend Gandalf. Okay, no, I don't think Gandalf represents Guido. I believe he represents Odin. Or should I say Jupiter? Or should I say Satan? Sorry, everyone. This isn't the world that you think it is. But I do encourage you to keep searching, keep seeking answers. And I'm pretty sure God's going to reveal more and more as we get closer to the end of this age. If you've managed to stay on for this whole presentation, thank you. Thank you for listening. And... Uh, I encourage you to go and look for more information from the Gen 6 websites, um, Steve Quayle, as well as the um, TLR movies. If you haven't seen them, please see what's happening in the world. See what's being revealed now. Thank you and blessings. Bye.